Nigerians only want to hear President Buhari, says human rights lawyer Femi Falana. And stop the influx of killer herdsmen, cleric urges President Buhari. Well, this is Plus Politics, and I am Mary Anna Cole. Human rights lawyer Femi Falana S.A.N. has urged President Muhammad Buhari to speak to Nigerians, saying the Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, only speaks for the federal government. And on the issue of banning of open grazing, former Senate leader, Senator Aline Dume, expressed his disagreement at the decision taken by the Southern governors. He noted that the insecurity problem in the country had nothing to do with open grazing and that it varied by ego political zones of the country. He also requested that the government stop the salaries of politicians to get the needed resources to tackle insecurity, if that would solve the problem. Well, joining us to discuss this is Baba Tunde Badamosi. He is a former ADP Lagos State gubernatorial candidate. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, just to quickly correct you, um, also a former PDP senatorial candidate. Great. The very last one from Lagos East Senatorial District. All right, great. I am in the PDP now. Ah, great. Okay. So let's start by looking at the situation in the country. Of course, you and everybody else who's um, in this country understands that we have been facing uh, different kinds of insecurity. Uh, but the most important thing that everybody wants to hear is the voice of the president. Um, first things first, people have been worried as to why it took the presidency this long to even act on the issue of killer herdsmen. And here we are now talking about all forms of insecurity in the southeast, in the south south, in the southwest, and of course in the north central. Of course, we know that Boko Haram has been at it for so long, but now we have different strains of uh, violence and terrorism. Of course, abductions and kidnappings now are the order of the day. So I'm going to start by asking: uh, Do you stand by what Senator Ndume is saying? Because he's saying that the governors are not um, prioritizing the most important thing and that banning of open grazing is the list of the problems that we have in the country. What's your take? I personally think that Senator Ndumi is speaking from both sides of his mouth. Um, the fact is the herdsmen are a very, very serious problem everywhere. We've had massacres, we've had of women being raped, we've had of farmers being killed on their farms, and it usually starts with cows wandering into, uh, farm, into farmland and uh, destroying crops belonging to farmers. Now, if we're going to stop, if we're going to stem the tide of these security issues, uh, you know, considering the reluctance, the apparent reluctance of the security agencies to engage these herdsmen uh, whenever they engage in these criminal activities of uh, criminal trespass, uh, vandalism, uh, arson sometimes, uh, burning farms, uh, criminal assault, murder a lot of the time. Um, if we're going to stop it, then we have to start with banning of open grazing. And I think the South, the, the Southern governors have done exactly what should have been done uh, over two to three years ago when some of us started shouting. Uh, I, I remember I started the argument that we must stop eating Fulani beef because if, uh, if it's beef, if it's cows that are causing the problem, then perhaps if there's no market for the beef, you know, that, that they're producing, then maybe the incidences of killings and, you know, robberies and rapes and, you know, all sorts of atrocities will, will stop altogether. So we've taken an important first step, but I think it's not, it's not quite far enough. I think we ought to um, also perhaps look at the issue, the economic issue, you know, the issue of engaging uh, economically with the health, we have to stop eating beef, stop eating Fulani meat of any type. Just need to stop it. You're taking me to a question that I kept for later, but I'm going to ask it because of what you just said. You referred to beef and cow as Fulani. I, I don't remember going to the market to ask for Fulani beef. 
Yes, um, I understand that. I, 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 that I'm sorry, I'm going the, somewhere. Let me let me just make the difference between what is Fulani beef and what is Yoruba beef. I understand that. But the fact is, the majority of meat that is sold in the markets today in most of southern Nigeria is, uh, you know, from cattle raised by Fulanis. Now, we have to make a conscious decision to decide whether our lives are, are, are more important than the meat that we eat. And we need to make a conscious decision. The state governments need to make a conscious decision. End of story. Um, we lost you there briefly, but let me go to my next question. Um, this issue of herders versus farmers has now metamorphosed into banditry. Um, it's now metamorphosed into abductions and kidnappings where ransoms are being asked for. Uh, before, it just used to be an issue of, oh, um, your, your cattle destroyed my farmland and then we're fighting you uh, or someone gets hurt and then more people come and then it's just, you know, fighting. But now it's killing, it's AK-47s involved. And now students from universities are being kidnapped. Five of them so far in Kaduna had been killed, um, if I'm not mistaken, and then some have been uh, rescued. But then the Greenfield University students are still in custody. So my question is, um, why did we let this linger for so long? What do you think was responsible for the lingering that has now metamorphosed into something that we are unable at this point to deal with decisively? I think mainly the problem has been irrational uh, political correctness and in a lot of cases fear, irrational fear, um, where I'm faced by people who clearly want to kill me. My immediate reaction would be to defend myself. That would be my immediate response, re defend myself by any and all means necessary. And now, some of us saw this coming as far back as 2011. Some people have seen it coming from as far back as 1989, when the Abuja Declaration was made that Nigeria was going to be Islamized. And running right underneath that was the uh, idea that there should be some kind of Fulani Empire of Africa, uh, which Nigeria would be the capital of it. Now, when Buhari started weeping during the campaigns, I told people, I said, these are crocodile tears. This man is not coming for Nigerians. He's coming for Fulanis, and we will learn a lesson very, very grievously when it does take over. Now we have learned the lesson. We learned the lesson between, 19, uh, between 2015 and 2019, and yet Nigerians refused to internalize those lessons and allowed this man to get back into office again in 2019. Now, that, that is unforgivable. That is beyond political correctness. That is uh, from going from the idea that someone from the Southwest now suddenly thinks that the time is right for him to become president. You know, you have to put it down eventually to greed, sheer naked greed and power mongering. So they allowed Buhari to get into office just because they wanted to become president. And they would, they would chase that presidential, presidential ambition at the cost of as many lives as it takes to get Buhari through the second four years. And I, I really think that time is up for him, for Buhari himself. He needs time. He needs to get out of that office so that Nigerians can stop dying like flies. Um, let me go to uh, the SAN's um, statement about you know, the president speaking to Nigerians because we not really heard the president, president address us, you know, do like a state address to address the issues. We've heard, you know, uh, the information minister, we've heard the presidential aides speak on this issue or, you know, put out press releases, but the president has not necessarily spoken on this issue. Now, Femi Falana, um, before he, you know, called out Mr. President, in 2018, I'd like to take you back, I think I was on the radio at the time, um, and the, the senior pastor of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, E.R. Dibuye, in 2018, was asking the president to stop the killings. Killings were happening in 2018. I remember um, where he said that if we, these killings are not stopped, we might not have free, fair, credible elections. It might also impede elections in different places at the time. And then fast forward to 2021, we're still here asking the president to speak and deal decisively on the, uh, with the issue of you know, insecurity in the country. Uh, there seems to be a pattern here. But 
for someone who's played in the political space, for a president who has wanted this office four times, and he, he's now in that office, why is it so difficult for Mr. President to, why do you think, because I know you're not in his mind, but what, why do you think he has not spoken to us? And if he did speak to us and address us, what good would it do? I am personally of the opinion that the killings are not stopping because Mr. President does not want them to stop. How do you mean? President wants these killings, Mr. President wants these killings to continue for whatever strange reason, because he's the president of Nigeria. The president of Nigeria is the most powerful democratically elected president in the world in terms of the constitutional powers that he has. He has a wide range of constitutional powers that he could reach for and put a stop, a final end to these killings by the Fulanis, but he will not do it because I believe, this is my personal opinion and I'm entitled to it, I believe that he's part and parcel of a Fulani expansionist agenda. I mean, imagine the governors of the southern states deciding that they were going to pass laws to end open grazing. And then some idiot Fulani man comes on TV, forgive my French, comes on TV the other day and says that Fulanese were not consulted. And we want to ask the question, how many southern Nigerians were consulted when Fulani started shooting people? How many southern governors were consulted when the president sat down with a bunch of other Fulani people and decided that they were going to in initiate a new security policy for the South, South and the Southeast? How many Southeasterners and South Southerners sat in that meeting when they made that decision? So Southern governors, democratically elected, or whatever that's worth, sat down and for the benefit of their peoples, decided that they did not want any more open grace. And if man comes out and says no full names were consulted, he must be out of his mind. Well, but he's not. But, Actually, he's but, not out of but his that mind. but that is he's, but that man was speaking I'm sorry, I'm sorry to speak over you. That man was speaking tackle. that man was speaking in his own capacity. He wasn't speaking as a mouthpiece of the president, neither was he speaking um, as a forerunner of Mr. President. So why are you really saying that the president uh, or this Fulani person and the president uh, has some Fulani expansion agenda? I'm yet to see well, your facts or the claims. As a person who had been in a high public office before, this is not the sort of utterance that you would expect from somebody of that standing. You know, you would expect a little more decorum, a little more circumspection from somebody of that standing. But it didn't happen. Why? Because he knew that the entire Fulani establishment, starting from the president down to the presidency, as it were, uh, down to the ministers and so on, and everybody else, the entire security apparatus, he knows that they are behind all of this. So he's confident enough to come out and challenge democratically elected, elected governors as to decisions that they have rightfully and properly taken to protect their people. Let's move on to, uh, again, Senator Alin Dume. He's proposing that um, public political office holders' um, salaries be slashed and those monies be... Um, used to fund the army. Now, let's not forget that Senator Dume is the chairman of the Senate Committee on the Army. And um, he's saying that the country needs to take care of soldiers. There have been um, many issues coming from our security forces, down from welfare uh, to uh, moribund, you know, fighting equipment. I mean, I have had uh, former soldiers and former people in the army who have been complaining that you know the army is not being properly taken care of they've also complained about the fact that there are moles in the army which are helping these terrorists one way or the other and uh, you know it's more like a, a, a spanner in the wheels of fighting terrorism how can we you know speed up and engage our soldiers and encourage them especially because of course um, they need that encouragement if we must win this war against insurgents and for a president who's also um, this is supposedly his constituency should that not be his priority let me start with the statement credited to senator Ndume. I, I i want to believe that he did not do that because if he did then he's been clever by, by more than half and the reason I say that is because the Minister for Finance came out the other day 
and said that the army had been given so many trillions over the years um, to buy weapons and so on. And the weapons are not forthcoming. And when they do, and when they do come, the weapons end up in the hands of Boko Haram. You know, you saw Boko Haram displaying MRAPs that they apparently seized from the army. And as you've said yourself, some of your friends, and I have colleagues and friends too in the army, uh, some of whom have you know, angrily retired, some of, some of them are still there, who complain that there appears pollution as some in their rank, you know, uh, with the, the Boko Haram people, to the effect that there is a definite feeling amongst people from a certain part of the country that they are being targeted for elimination by people from another part of the country, okay, uh, within the army, within... We lost you for a second, but uh, can you hear us? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So the, 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 there appears to be some kind of conspiracy, you know, a high-level conspiracy to eliminate people from a particular part of the country, fighting men from a particular part of the country, uh, and I say appears advisedly. Hmm. There appears to be this conspiracy to kill off, literally kill off, people from a particular part of the country by people from some other part of the country who seem to be in cahoots with the terrorists, bandits, Boko Haram, whatever name you choose to call the jihadis. That's what I call all of them uh, because they, they, are all, they all seem to be fighting for the same cause. I mean, look at Shiroro, for instance, Niger State, where they said bandits came and they took over Shiroro and bandits had taken over. The we saw was Boko Haram flags going up in Shiroro, two hours away from Abuja, the federal capital of Nigeria. Now, what does that tell you? And the president is sitting pretty, not saying a word. There doesn't appear to be any sense of urgency about the Shiro situation. Instead, the army is throwing all its resources into the southeast, attacking Olu, killing civilians, killing people. You know, that's all we're hearing about. We're not hearing about engaging uh, the, the, the terrorists in Shiro, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the bandits or the Boko Haram or whatever they are, whatever name they're called by in Shiroro, two hours away from the capital of Nigeria, two hours away from where the president of Nigeria is apparently sitting and refusing to address Nigerians. Hmm. Well, for those who have been asking the president to speak, uh, pressmen were, were at the presidential villa today as the president was celebrating um, Eid. And he did say a few words and did emphasize that he was going to deal decisively with the bandits. I, I don't know if my producers have that audio, would like to put it out um, so that you could listen to it. Maybe you could pick something from it. Uh, I, I don't know. Do we have that video? Because I want us to, I wa I want us to listen to it. All right, so we will play that video before this conversation is over. So we can hear what Mr. President had to say. Uh, he talked about, um, you know, the resources that are available to us uh, and, uh, you know, if these resources are available and are enough for us to deal with the situation that we have at hand. Let's take a look at that. Um, it's an audio, but of course we have Mr. President's picture on it and then we would come back and have this conversation. We want people to go back to the land so that... Uh uh, we can get enough food for the country and even export. And uh, we are hoping Nigerians uh, will understand the problem. Nigerians know at which stage we came, 2015, what stage we are now, both on security, both on economy. And... Uh, we are going by the constitution, we are doing our best, but uh, with the resources available and the manpower available to us, we are working very hard. And I think the National Assembly is cooperating very well. Um, with the resources available to us, they are uh, certainly giving us priority in our requirements, and we are doing our best. The important thing is, um, the elites must make the attempt to understand the military. If we order, say, uh, weapons and armored vehicles, it takes time for the manufacturers. It takes time when it is brought here eventually, shipped here, taken to our training institutions, 
training the trainers and then sending them to, This is a very, very long process. And uh, even if you, have, if you can have contact with the retired military chaps, they will tell you the difference between the time we came and now. How much hardware we have got, how much training we have done. If you don't know, go and ask people from Borno, from Adamawa, the difference in terms of security. And without security, you can't do anything. And in the South South, our biggest surprise uh, and disappointment is what is happening in the Northwest. And we, we are dealing with it. So that's the president. I'm sure you could pick some things, but if you didn't, I'll just put you through it because I wrote some things down. He started by asking farmers to go back to their farmlands um, because, of course, he's afraid of food shortage. Um, he said that um, Nigerians need to understand the problem and to see where we are now and where we were in 2015. Uh, he says also that the National Assembly has been cooperating with them to give them all that they need to deal with the situation at hand. Uh, he said, we are doing our best. He also talked about the fact that they've been getting enough hardware um, and they've done a lot of trainings um, that if we don't believe, we can go and ask the people in Boronu. And then he also states that he's shocked and surprised at what's happening in the North, but that they're doing their best. What's your take? I find the statement, that statement to reflect very clearly how the president is removed from reality. For him to suggest under the prevailing circumstances across the country where uh, Fulani cattle rearers and terrorists are going deliberately, quite deliberately, after farmers and farming communities in my opinion, in an attempt to instigate, to create famine, to create food scarcity, which they've succeeded at doing, by the way. Um, for him to suggest that people should go to the farms, I find that very disingenuous. I find it borderline genocidal. And I say borderline genocidal because I've had direct experience, almost direct experience of this. A friend of mine was kidnapped in Kurudu, uh, is a very popular man, very well known now. As I'm mentioning, the, the those people that live around the Kurudu axis will remember what I'm talking about. About a month ago, a friend of mine was kidnapped. Shortly after, another uh, person, another person that's known to me, was also kidnapped again in the Kurudu area, uh, around Imota, on their farms. So farmers have been targeted, and the people that kidnapped them were identified very clearly to be Fulani cattle rearers. We finally managed to get both of them free by paying huge amounts of money in ransom. Um, the police were no help, the DSS were no help. Everybody just said, pay and get them out of that. You know, um, at the end of the day, for the president to suggest that without any concomitant increase in security present in communities is, you know, almost as if he's promoting genocide of facilitating genocide. That's what it sounds like to me. And I, I really would suggest, you know, to any farming communities country, if you want to go back to the farm, then make sure that, they are, that you are very well armed and prepared for an attack by Fulani terrorists or Fulani cattle And I make no apologies to anybody for, for calling them out for who they are. Uh, well, it's, it's uh, 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 to borrow your word, it's disingenuous to just um, blanket call every person um, who's or terrorists you know a sudden from a sudden community in Nigeria you can't say that these people this particular ethnic group is responsible for all the terrorism that we have been experiencing in the country yes there are people who have been caught who are seemingly um, from that Fulani extraction but does it mean that every because when you keep saying Fulani hurts man and I'm, I, I mean I'm just playing the devil's advocate here it makes it look like every Fulani person should be ostracized because one full new person or a handful of them are committing all sorts of forms of you know um, violence and atrocities I just say that do you know back in the back in the uh, early noughties when the OPC were running riots all over Lagos you know 
uh, a lot of Yoruba people spoke up okay, against their activities. The president at the time was a Yoruba man, Olusegun Obasanjo. He spoke up. He did not just speak up. He actually picked up the leaders of the OPC at the time. Dr. Frederick Fashion and Ghani Adams, he picked them both up to put a stop to what he perceived as, and what everybody could see, was, you know, some kind of uh, internet imbalance amongst the OPC factions. Now, that was a precedent. This president has his kinsmen running around killing people all over the place, okay? Doing far worse than OPC ever did in the, in the early noughties, as I said. And he has totally avoided, avoided either talking about it or engaging them in any way. And I, I, I see that as an application, a very, very serious application of his part. And it's one of the reasons why I've been calling since 2015 for his resignation. He either resigns or he, he or the Senate does their job, the National Assembly does the job that they force themselves into that house for and impeach him. If, you know, too many people have died to keep this man in office. Too many people have died. All right, finally, before I let you go, before we wrap up this conversation, now that we've heard, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have watched that video uh, of the president speaking uh, about, you know, dealing with the issue of banditry. Um, do we still need the president to address the nation? Um, we have no idea that that was, in fact, the president. Okay, because we didn't see a video. We just heard an audio. Well, there is that a could, video. That could, there is technology available to make to to make anyone's voice sound well, like. I'm anyone's, telling you that there is voice. there was a video. He was interviewed in Asso Rock during the Eid festivities today, and that was the president. Well, that's the story we're told. There, there's nothing that there's look, listen. There's nothing that emanates from that presidency that I personally would believe anymore. Nothing. Well, well, I'm telling you again that the president spoke and we saw his face. But I want to say, say thank you to you. Uh, Babatunde Badamosi uh, is a former, uh, former presidential, uh, sorry, former senatorial candidate for the People's Democratic here, uh, Party here in Lagos State. Thank you so much for speaking with us. All right, we'll take a short break. And when we come back, the president, of course, is still on the table. We're still asking... Um, Mr. President, to stop the influx of um, Fulani herdsmen into the country. Yes, we'll be right back after the break. Stay with us.